Hello, this is Michael Altos. We are continuing our discussion of the GI system and antihistamines. This is session part two. We are not going to get into a lot of detail on PONV, postoperative nausea and vomiting, because it's a pretty major topic and really beyond the scope of a pharmacology lecture. Uh, obviously, you need to know about patient-specific and procedure-specific factors that lead to postoperative nausea and vomiting. Um, and we've discussed anesthetic agents and techniques that can affect likelihood of postoperative nausea and vomiting. When we have patients suffering from nausea, we have to rule out important causes like hypotension, hypoxia, hypoglycemia, increased intracranial pressure, and gastric bleeding, just to name a few. This chart reminds us that there is a vomiting center in the brain, and it has many different inputs that stimulate it. And some of these inputs can be mapped to specific receptors. Uh, these receptors include histamine, uh, cholinergic, uh, dopamine, serotonin, uh, substance P, and many others. And a lot of our anti-emetic drugs can target one or more of these inputs in order to reduce the incidence of nausea and vomiting. These figures are taken from the most recent consensus statement on postoperative nausea and vomiting. Uh, this, just to orient, orient you to some of the figures, on the upper left here we see the four classic risk factors for postoperative nausea and vomiting. Uh, these are known commonly as the Apfel score, after Dr. Apfel, who uh, was one of the authors of the paper. And those factors are female gender, non-smoker, history of PONV or motion sickness, and the intended use of postoperative opioids for pain control. Uh, with, each with, with each additional risk factor, the risk of postoperative nausea and vomiting goes up by about 20%, so that with four risk factors, you have an 80% chance of PONV. Uh, below this, we see PDNV, post-discharge nausea and vomiting. Um, and there are five risk factors listed here. Again, female gender, history of PONV. Now we have age below 50, use of opioids in PACU and nausea uh, in PACU. Uh, in the middle of this slide, we see uh, table two from this figure, which shows lots of different risk factors for PONV, uh, those that are known to be positive risk factors, those that are more controversial, and those that have been thought to be risk factors, but in fact do not have data to support that. And on the right side, we see what they seem to consider are the eight primary risk factors for PONV with some indication of uh, what role they play in the outcome. So I would say you would be wise to know the eight primary risk factors for PONV. Those would be the four of the Apfel score, again, female sex, non-smoker, history of PONV, and postoperative opioid analgesia. And then the other four factors, which are younger age, which seems to be below age 50, as best as I can tell, the use of volatile anesthetic agents, the type of surgery, knowing that some surgeries are more emetogenic than others, um, and those would be like cholecystectomy, laparoscopic surgery, gynecological surgery, as well as certain surgeries on the ear and eye, and then the duration of surgery. So having covered that, we can talk about strategies to reduce the baseline risk of PONV, which would include avoiding triggering agents, um, minimizing opioids, adequate hydration, choosing sugamidex instead of neostigmine. And even though this is old data, it's a good reminder that if you look at a person's risk of PONV, and that's the first column here going from 10 to 80%, each intervention decreases your risk. So if you have someone who only has one risk, uh, only a 10% risk of PONV, adding additional modalities is unlikely to change their risk of PONV very much. But if someone has an 80% risk of PONV, each additional risk factor really decreases their risk. Each additional intervention really decreases their risk of PONV by quite a bit. All of this leads us to what is the current consensus statement, which says, A, look at risk factors. And for some reason, they've only listed six, but we have uh, indicated eight risk factors in our previous slide. Consider ways to mitigate risk. And I think the take home message here is really point number three, which is the risk stratification. And right now, uh, they are recommending that patients with one to two risk factors should get two agents to uh, decrease risk of PONV, and patients with more than two risk factors should be given three to four agents. 
We have a list of some of the different prophylactic agents, which we'll discuss in more detail. And then a plan should be in place for rescue treatments as well if the prophylactic treatments fail. The first drug we'll talk about are the 5-HT3 receptor antagonists. These are serotonin receptor antagonists, and ondansetron, or Zofran, is the most commonly used. Other drugs in this category include dolacetron and granisetron. These drugs are best when given at the end of surgery. We give 4 milligrams of ondansetron, the other drug doses listed as seen. Common side effects include headache, perhaps liver elevated liver enzymes, and constipation. There's also risk of prolonged QTC interval, similar to what we saw with droperidol. And so in patients who already have a prolonged QTC, these drugs should be used with caution and perhaps with cardiac monitoring. Dexamethasone is quite effective for PONV prophylaxis. The mechanism is unclear, although it probably acts in the central nervous system, likely in the medulla. The dose is four or five milligrams IV, best given at the induction of anesthesia, and this should be as effective as four milligrams of ondansetron. Usually only one dose is given. There are some studies that suggest higher doses of 0.1 milligrams per kilogram may be effective. There are conflicting studies about whether there are adverse effects with this single dose of dexamethasone. Some suggest there could be increased risk of wound infection, and it may not be the best choice in diabetic patients who have very labile blood sugars. Drugs like droperidol or haloperidol are effective for PONV prophylaxis, working at the central dopamine receptors in the CTZ and other parts of the brain. Droperidol was dosed at 0.625 to 1.25 milligrams IV, and was as effective as four milligrams of ondansetron. Even though it's hard to find now because of the black box warning, droperidol at this very low dose was probably unlikely to cause much significant QTC prolongation. Haloperidol is still available and is effective at a dose of 0.5 to 2 milligrams IV or IM. Most effective when given at the end of surgery and side effects as we've learned before include sedation, anxiety, restlessness, and dystonia. As we mentioned, droperidol has its black box warning with risk of torsade in patients with QT prolongation. This is controversial and may not be clinically relevant. It's probably just as safe as haloperidol or ondansetron. And the QTC prolongation we see with droperidol and ondansetron is no worse than with either drug alone. Nevertheless, it's reasonable to have continuous ECG monitoring for a couple hours after using these drugs. Practically, we see people giving ondansetron without any monitoring at all. Antihistamines, as we discussed earlier, can be effective antiemetic drugs. These include diphenhydramine, dimenhydrinate, which is dramamine, and meclizine, which is dramamine or antivert. These suppress the vestibular neuronal firing, as well as having anticholinergic and sedative effects, and can be very effective for motion sickness as well. The Benadryl dose is usually 12 and a half to 25 milligrams IV. The dimenhydrinate is a milligram per kilogram. Meclizine, 50 milligrams orally. Side effects are anticholinergic, including sedation, dry mouth, and urinary retention. Phenothiazines like promethazine or phenergan or procloperazine, compazine, also act at the dopamine receptors and have a significant antihistamine and anticholinergic effect. The promethazine is usually dosed at 6.25 to 25 milligrams IV or IM. If you're using it prophylactically, you give it with induction of anesthesia. Side effects include significant sedation and risk for extrapyramidal symptoms. Promethazine also has been associated with vascular necrosis, and it should either be given IM or else as an IV infusion rather than as an IV bolus. Metaclopramide or Reglan, we discussed earlier, it acts both as a dopamine at the dopamine receptor as well as 
a GI prokinetic. It's not really used as a first-line therapy for PONV anymore, probably because 10 milligrams IV is not an effective dose. Patients will need greater than 20 milligrams, maybe as much as 50 milligrams, but at these high doses we see increased side effects, such as hypotension and tachycardia. Patients can become dyskinetic or have extrapyramidal symptoms at high doses, and this can be attenuated by treating with benzodiazepines or antihistamines. Anticholinergics, like scopalamine, can be effective as a transdermal patch. It antagonizes the M1 receptors in the cerebral cortex and the pons, also blocks histamine receptors in the hypothalamus and the vomiting center. When used as a patch, the onset of effect takes at least two to four hours, but the effect will last up to 72 hours. Side effects may include blurred vision, dry mouth, dizziness, or agitation. Other anticholinergics, like atropine or glycopyrrolate, do not seem to have much of a clinically significant antiemetic effect. A newer, sub, a newer substance, a substance P antagonist called a prepotent or amend, blocks the NK1 receptor. It may also augment the activity of ondansetron and dexamethasone. Usually it's given 4 milli 40 mg PO within three hours of induction of anesthesia. This drug is expensive. Side effects include constipation and hypotension. Also, notably, birth control medicines that contain hormones, this includes pills, patches, implants, and some IUDs, may have decreased effectiveness after a prepotent is given. The manufacturer recommends that a backup non-hormonal method of birth control should be used for 28 days after the last dose is given. There's some talk that an IV formulation may become available for this drug. Ephedrine, which we've talked about before, is not a first-line therapy for PONV. There isn't really good evidence or clear mechanism for how it would work. It's probably related to something other than maintaining blood pressure. But we do see that in some patients, 25 to 50 milligrams IM at the end of surgery can help with PONV. We know that propofol can be helpful as an antiemetic drug, even in subhypnotic dosing. It can be used as an adjunct to general anesthesia or as part of a TIVA. The dose should be at least 20 micrograms per kilogram per minute. People have, always, people have also used propofol as a bolus in PACU as a rescue therapy. Obviously, the dose needs to be very low, 10 to 20 milligrams, and probably has a short duration of action but this can be helpful in an urgent situation. Finally, there is a list of options which are not well supported by evidence, some more evidence-based than others, that have also been tried. These include midazolam, adequate hydration, the P6 acupressure point, low-dose naloxone, and ginger. Even more questionable, but still used, are supplemental oxygen, and inhaling the fumes from isopropyl alcohol. That's the end of this section. Please let me know, as always, if you have any questions.